Ms. Lisa Curtis, uh, former security director for South Asia at the U.S. National Security Council under President Trump. Thank you so much for coming to AMU TV and for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here in the studio with you, Sami. Thank you. So my first question is, you were heavily involved in the talks with the Taliban in Doha um, from 2019 to later on. Was this the outcome that you were expecting from the negotiations with the Taliban? Well, uh, I definitely didn't expect the negotiations to be handled the way that they were handled by Ambassador Khalilzad. I think when the negotiation process first started, uh, the thinking was maybe there would be a couple of meetings between uh, the U.S. and the Taliban, but that the Afghan government would quickly be brought into the room. There was never this expectation that the U.S. would cut a separate deal with mm. the Taliban. Uh, so I think I was very disappointed in how the Doha deal came out, how the negotiations uh, proceeded. I think far too many concessions were given to the Taliban. It wasn't handled uh, like a genuine negotiation. In a genuine negotiation, there's give and take and there's compromise on both sides. Well, the Taliban made no compromises in the Doha deal and it did not serve the Afghan people. So I was very disappointed. Did it the serve the, the American people? I don't think it served the American people either. I think if you talk to Ambassador Khalilzad, he says, well, you know, no U.S. soldiers were killed on the way out as they left Afghanistan. To me, that's not, um, that's not good enough. Uh, if we're, uh, that's, a, that's a withdrawal process. That's a surrender process. That's not a peace process. So we need to call it what it is. So you want to call it a surrender process and a surrender agreement, not a peace process or peace deal, right? Absolutely, because that's what it was. It was a withdrawal agreement. It was not a peace agreement. There, there's not peace in Afghanistan. There's, there's been no compromise uh, for a political solution. It From was, the Taliban side. That's right. The Taliban basically took over the country and they took away uh, human rights, uh, mostly of women and girls. Are you trying to say that Ambassador Khalilzad was not representing uh, the American government correctly or uh, justly, or are you saying that he was representing himself and his interests? What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that the Doha deal did not serve the interests of the American people or the American government. But, but you also said that you were not happy with the way the um, uh, peace process was and the negotiations was handled by, by uh, Ambassador Khalilzad. Was it just you not happy or the administration in, in whole were not happy about this? Well, I think there are some people, uh, aside from myself, that weren't happy with the way the negotiations went. But clearly uh, there were you know, senior U.S. officials who did approve of what, what Ambassador Khalilzad did, otherwise he would not have been able to do it. But I think that people probably misunderstood the situation. I think that probably Ambassador Khalilzad was representing it in, in a false way to uh, the president, to the secretary of state. Um, and there was a, a misunderstanding of what was going to happen when U.S. troops left. And there was only a handful of people who really understood the situation uh, for what it, what it was. Yeah, oh, we heard that uh, President Ashraf Ghani was very happy once you joined uh, uh, the peace process, uh, since he was not very happy uh, also the way uh, Ambassador Khalizad was handling the peace process. Uh, do you remember your talks with uh, Mr. Ghani and, and uh, what kind of um, like, like concerns he was sharing with you? Well, uh, whenever I was in a meeting, it was with Ambassador Khalilzad. So uh, the meeting was between Ambassador Khalilzad and uh, President Ghani. 
uh, so yes, I was in the room, but Ambassador Khalil's I was doing most of the talking. Um, but I think what, what I would say is that uh, National Security Advisor Ambassador Bolton, John Bolton, when he was National Security Advisor, and this is a matter of record, you can read his book and he talks about it, uh, you know, agreed that this peace process, so-called peace process, was not serving U.S. interests and that Ambassador Khalilzad was not handling it correctly. However, after he resigned his position, which was in September 2019, um, after he left, there was really no, um, you know, cabinet level official that was pushing back on what Ambassador Khalilzad was doing. But he did represent, as you said, uh, senior American officials, including um, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Pompeo and, and uh, President Trump at that time. Did he have um, um, their support in what he was doing and the way he was handling the process? Or are you trying to say that they were deceived by, by, uh, by Ambassador Khalidzad? Well, I think there was some deception probably involved. I think President Trump, for his part, uh, really only cared about getting U.S. troops out. I don't think he cared much about uh, the peace process or you know what was happening uh, with the Doha negotiations. Um, I you know I really can't speak for Secretary Pompeo, but clearly Zhao Halilzad did have the support from Secretary Pompeo and you know uh, the president to be negotiating this deal. Otherwise, he would not have been able to do it. But again, I don't think there was clear understanding uh, from you know, the president or the secretary of state uh, exactly what was going to happen when US troops left. I don't think anybody uh, you know, was aware of the dire situation and the fact that the Taliban were not interested in compromise uh, and that just was not fully understood. Did you try to raise your concerns with other uh, officials, senior officials at the U.S. government? Um, I mean, not just Ambassador Khalilzad, but your seniors like uh, um, uh, Mr. John Bolton or Pompeo or, or other uh, senior officials. I did raise my concerns and, and uh, what happened? repeatedly. Well. Clearly, I was overruled. And, you know, that's an uncomfortable position to be in. And I had to think about whether I would stay in the government, um, knowing that things were moving in a direction that I didn't feel was the right direction for the United States. Um, so that, you know, that's a difficult uh, situation to be in. It's a difficult decision to make. And I think one holds out the hope that they're going to be able to you know, eventually impact the situation. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the talks went in a very disappointing direction. And I don't think it's surprising. Uh, I personally am, was not surprised to see uh, what happened in August of 2021. Well, um, you know, from the negotiations, once the government of Afghanistan was isolated both by, by the U.S. and also by the Taliban during the negotiations, it was kind of clear that uh, that was the end of uh, Ashraf Ghani's government. But did you envision that this is going to be the end of the state entirely as well? Well, I, I did not think that the uh, Ghani government would uh, disappear as quickly uh, as it did. Um, I did think that the government would hold on for a period of time, um, even after the U.S. Uh, left. So it, it, it collapsed uh, more quickly than even I could have imagined. But I think that's because, you know, President Ghani did leave the country unexpe unexpectedly and abruptly. Um, and nobody planned for that. Nobody could have expected that. But almost all provinces were gone when Ashraf Ghani fled the country. So it was not like the government had control over the country and he fled. 
he, of course, he is, he is um, responsible for mismanagement of, of the country and his government, but the, the country had collapsed, no? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's right. And I think one thing that surprised me was when President Ghani visited Washington, I think it was June or July of 2021, and he put on a brave face. Uh, he, he did not come across as a leader in crisis that was um, seeing you know, provinces fall one by one. Uh, so that was always confusing, why he did not uh, just come to the U.S. with his honest opinion and what he knew was happening in his country and the fact that things were falling apart very quickly. Was it because he was not being honest or because he didn't have a good uh, grasp of the reality on the ground? Well, I suppose he would have to answer that question, but I think, you know, myself sitting in Washington, D.C. and having an idea of what was happening, uh, certainly, you know, being the president, he, he should have realized what was happening and, and been honest about the, uh, the weaknesses of his government. So not everything adds up uh, in this situation. I think there's a lot of people that, you know, there are a lot of questions still to be so asked. So you're saying that when he uh, showed this uh, brave face, uh, like nothing is going to happen to his government, so that deceived policymakers and decision makers here in the in the uh, U.S. You know, I can't speak for the U.S. officials. Um, I think that you know, for people on the the outside of the administration who were observing the situation, like myself, I think it was confusing. I think his message was confusing, and it did make it harder uh, to build, you know, support within the US government uh, for you know, continued things like um, uh, supporting the government with airstrikes. You know, that was one of the, the big decisions that was being made at that time. Would the US still provide air support to the Afghan troops? Um, you know, closing down Bagram Air Base, that was another uh, decision. I mean, there were mistakes on all sides. And you know, that's why the Afghanistan War Commission has been established on Capitol Hill. This is something that they will have to explore. They'll have to look at, you know, why was Bagram Air Base closed down? Um, why weren't Afghans evacuated more quickly? Uh, why didn't the Biden administration anticipate uh, the quick fall of Kabul? Um, you know, why were all these decisions made so quickly and so abruptly? I think you know, these are the things that we need answers to. Well, President Ghani opposed some decisions by the U.S. Um, government, but he was forced to, um, at least he says that he was forced to, you know, uh, adhere. Um, uh, for example, releasing of thousands of, uh, uh, you know, Taliban prisoners from um, uh, prisons inside the country, uh, he was he says that he was forced by the U.S. government. That's no? true. The Trump administration forced Ghani to release 5,000 Taliban prisoners, including top terrorist leaders who were behind green on blue attacks on uh, U.S. soldiers, French soldiers, U.K. soldiers, um, Australian soldiers. And the only country that really spoke out against the release of these individuals was the Australian government. Um, then Prime Minister Scott Morrison wrote a letter to President Trump essentially begging him not to force Ghani to release Sergeant Hekbatula, who was responsible for killing several Australian soldiers while they you know, played a game um, on, on the base. They were essentially you know, relaxing uh, on the base and they were killed by this um, Taliban or Taliban-affiliated person opposing as an Afghan soldier. That's why we called it green on blue attack. So, you know, the, this is what happened during the Trump administration. And there needs to be answers from uh, people on why uh, the U.S. forced Ghani to release these 5,000 Taliban prisoners. You know, what was the purpose? And, you know, what was going to be the impact on the government by releasing these 5,000 prisoners? Uh, this is what I'm saying. This was a major concession to the Taliban and one that did not have to be made. 
And I think, you know, this also needs to be looked at. Why were these decisions made, uh, you know, just to have this piece of paper, you know, signed, this um, so-called peace agreement, which was really a withdrawal agreement. Yeah, so I have a final question on this topic, and then I will ask another question on other piece of, two other piece of, pieces of peep, uh, paper that were signed, and uh, we'll ask you if they meant anything. Um, my, my, my question is, what did you feel personally when you heard that uh, President Ghani and his aides have uh, left the country and fled like that, as you said, abruptly? Well, I thought it was devastating because, you know, right after the news came that he had left, we saw the pictures of the Taliban walking around the presidential palace, essentially taking over the country. It was absolutely devastating uh, to see that the government had fallen so quickly into the hands of Taliban. So I think, I think for those of us who, you know, had been closely following Afghanistan, um, who, who understood that the Taliban had not changed, that there was no such thing as a Taliban 2.0. Um, it was absolutely devastating to see, you know, 20 years of U.S. investment into this country um, just being um, thrown away, uh, you know, in a very, you know, in very short order. President Karzai signed the um, uh, strategic um, partnership with the United States during uh, President Barack Obama, but he refused to sign the BSA. He was saying BSA is not going to bring peace and security for Afghanistan, and the region was against it. Uh, at the end of the day, did BSA save Afghanistan? From so the way I remember it was, Karzai did object to signing the BSA, but eventually. Um, held a jirga, a loyal jirga, and there was uh, support uh, among the Afghan people for signing the BSA. So eventually he did sign the bilateral security agreement. Um, but in the end, you're right, that did not save Afghanistan. And I would say that the uh, Doha negotiations between the Taliban and the United States was really a betrayal of the bilateral security agreement. So, you know, um, Karzai signed the strategic partnership uh, agreement with the United States, mm -hmm. not the BSA. BSA's, BSA was signed by Hanifa Atmar just after the 2014 elections. So, uh, but, but Karzai's assessment and prediction, do you think he was right not to sign the BSA? Uh, did it mean anything for sec uh, Afghanistan's security and national interest? Well, look, that was a, a different time. Uh, you know, if we're going back to before 2014, that's almost 10 years ago. So I don't necessarily think that Karzai was right to not sign that. What, what did that gain Afghanistan by not signing that? But, but what did it gain for Afghanistan, Afghanistan to sign it? It didn't well, gain anything. Well, it, it, it did by 10 years. You know, the U.S. kept troops for 10 more years in Afghanistan. So the, the U.S. Pro continued to provide support to the Afghan security forces, to the Afghan people for, you know, almost, well, at that time, you know, eight more years, you know, seven or eight more years after 2014. But uh, at the end, when Afghanistan was facing its, uh, the, you know, the hardest days, uh, the BSA didn't uh, save it because Taliban, um, the United States had another agreement with the adversary of Afghan government, which is the Taliban. Well, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, the, the, it made no sense. It was nonsensical. The Doha agreement was nonsensical. You were, you were basically um, signing away the country with the insurgents who were trying to take over the country and you were undermining the Afghan government, the, the, the Afghan authorities that you had been supporting for 20 years. And you, you were uh, basically Ambassador Khalilzad was, you know, switching horses. He was simply, you know, uh, turning toward the Taliban and giving the Taliban anything that they were asking for. And this was demoralizing for the Afghan people, for the Afghan security forces. And it, it really uh, was a, 
a poorly negotiated agreement. And, you know, it, it is something that, that the U.S. Uh, you know, finally needs to discard. So the Taliban are now uh, in Kabul running the country. Uh, do you think that Taliban are now reliable counterterrorism partners for the United States? I do not think the Taliban are reliable counterterrorism partners for the United States. Just because the United States and Taliban both oppose ISKP, Islamic State, Khorasan province, does not mean that the Taliban will be a good counterterrorism partner for the United States. And that is because the Taliban is still closely allied with Al Qaeda. They still have those relationships. Uh, there's even, you know, former Al Qaeda leaders. Um, you know, one is a governor, uh, the governor of uh, Kapisa province. Uh, there's a couple that are in, you know, senior Taliban government uh, positions. Uh, so the links between Taliban and Al Qaeda are still very close. And even if Al Qaeda is laying low for the time being, I don't think that we should be confident that they won't eventually rebuild their base and become a threat to the United States once again. I think one of the, the demands that should have been made of the Taliban was to break their ties to Al Qaeda. That should have been a, a fundamental uh, part but of the Doha in, Agreement. But it is in Doha deal. It's not. If you read it closely, uh, what the Doha Agreement says is that the Taliban will not allow Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups to threaten the United States from Afghanistan. It does not say they have broken ties. Um, it does not say that you know they will kick them out of the country. That's that's what breaking ties means. You you kick them out of the country. Uh, but you we force them to see, leave the country. We didn't see um, you know um, much of a big reaction from the U.S. after killing Zawahiri. I, I mean, uh, towards or against the Taliban, although uh, they were saying that. Taliban were harboring now Zawahiri inside Kabul, and they were, he was killed inside Kabul by uh, a U.S. airstrike. But we didn't see much of a policy change towards uh, the Taliban. Why is that? Well, I think if you look at the initial statements right after Zawahiri uh, was eliminated, uh, it was very clear that you know this wasn't due to any help from the Taliban. That the U.S. you know simply had. Um, very, you know, sophisticated ways uh, to track him, and he wasn't doing much to cover his own tracks. I think he he probably felt safe. Um, he had protection from the Taliban, from the Haqqani network in particular. Uh, but it, it was clear that um, this was an example of how close the Taliban and Al Qaeda still were. No, why there is no a uh, strong reaction from the U.S. government against the Taliban about Al-Qaeda? Well, I think they, the U.S. government eliminated Zawahiri and they... And did nothing to those who, you know, uh, were supporting and hiding Zawahiri inside Kabul. Uh, that's right. There, there was really no consequence for the Taliban. Why is that? Or Al-Qaeda. I think the U.S. probably feels it doesn't have much leverage and it felt if it took Zawahiri, you know, off of the battleground, that that would help um, degrade Al Qaeda, and you know that uh, probably the U.S. government felt that it would try to move on, and you know try to see if it could get more assistance from the Taliban, since the Taliban saw the capabilities that the United States had. Um, but again, I, I think that uh, it, it's naive to think that the Taliban are going to be good counterterrorism partners for the United States. The Taliban are going to do what's in the Taliban's interest. They're going to uh, you know, deal with ISKP with or without U.S. assistance uh, because Earlier, ISKP is an enemy of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Earlier you mentioned that it was Khalil Zad who was mishandling the U.S. Uh, policy towards the Taliban and towards Afghanistan, basically. Mm -hmm. But we haven't seen much change in the U.S. policy towards the Taliban or towards Afghanistan, even after, um, you know, Mr. Khalizat resigned from his uh, position. 
So people inside Afghanistan wonder, is it individuals uh, misinterpreting uh, U.S. foreign policy towards Afghanistan? Or this is really, you know, the U.S. foreign policy, no matter uh, if it's a Republican administration or a Democrat administration. What do you think? Well, I, I hope that, um, you know, there are individuals that would uh, put consequences on the Taliban for its treatment of women and girls. Unfortunately, we don't see uh, the U.S. government uh, speaking out as much as they should be on the situation of women and girls uh, right now. Um, I think we've seen, you know, some activities we've seen at the U.N. There was 11 countries that called for what's happening against women and girls uh, to be labeled gender apartheid, which I think is, is the right uh, solution. There should be consequences. There should be sanctions, human rights sanctions on the Taliban uh, for not allowing girls to go to school, not allowing women to work, barely allowing women to leave their houses. Um, this is, uh, you know, egregious human rights abuses uh, against women and girls. And the fact that the U.S. is not standing up more for women and girls in Afghanistan, I think is a big mistake. It's a big mistake that the Biden administration is making. Um, you do see some voices on Capitol Hill, people like uh, Congressman McCall, who actually held um, a, a meeting on uh, women and girls in Afghanistan, um, had people like our, our mutual friend Hadia Amiri speak, um, provide testimony at that hearing, um, uh, and others, I think this is uh, really important. And uh, unfortunately, you're right. We see the Biden administration largely following in the footsteps of Ambassador Khalilzad with this misplaced thinking that, you know, somehow, you know, the Taliban is different. They're going to cooperate on terrorism. Um, but I think there is one difference. And I think the difference is this. I think Ambassador Khalilzad would repeatedly say the Taliban are going to be different. You know, they're going to treat women differently. The Biden administration now uh, basically says, well, we don't think the Taliban's going to change. They're not going to change their policy on women. Therefore, we're not going to even try. And, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, you have to stand up for your own principles you, you mean, and values. You mean, you mean Biden administration has given up on yes. changing the Taliban or... On women and girls issues in particular. So you're not happy the way uh, Rina Amiri and Tom West are handling U.S. foreign policy towards Afghanistan? Well, I would just simply say I would like to see U.S. engagement with the Taliban conditioned, conditioned on how they're treating women and girls. I would like to see that more uh, as a stipulation. Uh, what could be done? What do you think? Well, I think that um, you could implement uh, more sanctions, human rights related sanctions. Um, you know, certainly keep the travel restrictions on the Taliban and enforce those uh, travel restrictions. Um, I mean, we have seen a reduction in the travel of the Taliban Foreign Minister Motaki. He was in in Russia. Yes, last he week. was yesterday. He was. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at the total number of trips he took in 2022 or 2023 compared to previously, definitely they they have been reduced. Um, so yeah, I think more sanctions, and then lower the level of engagement. Uh, with the Taliban. Certainly don't send U.S. officials into Kabul. I don't think that is a good idea. And certainly Congressman McCall has written a letter to Secretary Blinken saying that very thing, uh, that U.S. officials should not travel into Afghanistan for meetings. Um, but even in Doha, I think the, there should be a lower level engagement, you know, technical engagement, maybe talking about provision of humanitarian assistance but there should be no hint of providing any kind of legitimacy so, to a government that is not going to educate its women and girls. So you're saying Tom West, Rina Amiri, and others shouldn't meet with Mutaki and other Taliban, senior Taliban I don't officials. think so. 
I don't think so. I don't think they deserve um, that kind of attention from the U.S. government when they are going to um, egregiously abuse the human rights of half, half of the Afghan population. Um, what about, you know, engaging with uh, some other politicians who are you know, like, like um, former Republic uh, era um, officials and other political activists? What do you think? Should the U.S. Uh, engage with these figures? Absolutely. I think U.S. officials should be engaging with those Afghans who support human rights, civil society, um, because they, they are uh, also voices of the Afghan people. The Taliban don't re represent the Afghan people. They did not come to power through an election. Uh, they've come to power through force. So there should be other voices outside of Afghanistan who can uh, you know, support the, the human rights and civil society inside Afghanistan. So yeah, I think that U.S. officials should be spending more time engaging with these individuals. Now, the major problem is there are so many divisions among the Afghans, the expatriate Afghans, Afghans living outside of Afghanistan, that that job is, is made pretty difficult. Um, there are many divisions. I so one of, one of uh, the policy lines that we have heard time and again from the U.S. officials about Afghanistan is that um, any kind of no you know, um, military resistance or armed resistance against the Taliban should be supported or uh, the U.S. is uh, in uh, favor of, you know, supporting any armed resistance. What do you think about that? Well, I think that is the right policy. Um, I think that the U.S. can support, uh, you know, politically and, you know, give voice and empower um, Afghans living outside of Afghanistan who want to see a different future for Afghanistan. Uh, but providing arms, you know, encouraging, you know, military uh, uprisings, that would not be the right policy uh, for the United States. Um, the U.S. is not interested in sending troops back to Afghanistan. That's clear. Um, what about U.S., you know, um, regional interests in Afghanistan and around Afghanistan? Do you think Taliban would be, uh, you know, a good uh, or at least a partner to uh, safeguard U.S. Uh, interest in the region in South Asia and Central Asia and also West Asia. Do you, do you see Taliban doing uh, anything like that? Well, I think the U.S. is engaged with the Central Asian countries, with Pakistan, with India, um, certainly not Iran, but, but other countries in the region and, you know, could be doing more with some of these countries to encourage support for women and human rights, you know, that's how the U.S. should be engaging with the regional partners, um, encouraging them to stand up for the principles of human rights with the Taliban. Unfortunately, right now, what we see is each of the regional countries is kind of pursuing their, their own interests with the Taliban, whether it's economic or strategic or counterterrorism. Um, and nobody's really standing up for women and girls in the region. And that, but maybe because they don't have a great record of human rights either themselves. Well, I think some of the countries you can make that argument, but uh, you know, I think it, it still would behoove countries like India, which is you know the world's largest democracy. Um, they should cer certainly be standing up for uh, you, you democracy. Have, you know. Um, a vast experience in covering Pakistan and, and analyzing Pakistan. What do you make of, you know, all these attacks on different cities of Pakistan in the past few months? Like there are like several attacks every week. What's happening? Is it really supported uh, by the Taliban in Afghanistan, rooted in Afghanistan? Or what's, what's your take on that? Well, uh, this is not the first time that Pakistan has faced uh, a rash of terrorist attacks. You remember before 2014, from the period of about 2009 to 2014, 
there were so many terrorist attacks inside Pakistan by Tariki Taliban Pakistan or the TTP. Um, the Pakistanis cracked down after 2014. That was after the major attack on the military school in Peshawar. Uh, so you, you did see um, the terrorist attacks slow down after that period. It does seem like they are starting to ratchet back up after the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. So what does that tell us? That tells us that uh, the Taliban is you know, not doing a very good job at cracking down on TTP bases inside Afghanistan. And I think this has become a, a bit of a source of tension between is it, is the it, Pakistani authorities and the and, Taliban. And the Taliban. Is but it I think, yeah, one thing we have to remember is that, you know, Pakistan has supported the Taliban for so many years um, and still does. And I think it was Hillary Clinton who famously said, you can't expect to have snakes in your backyard and not have them bite you one day. And so I think, you know, what we are seeing in Pakistan with the increase in TTP attacks is partially a result of their own policies of allowing the Taliban to um, to grow and and supporting them all these years. Yes, but what is the role of the Taliban uh, regime in Afghanistan in all these attacks and uh, re, uh, resurgence of TTP in, in Pakistan? Well, I think that uh, most Pakistanis would say the Taliban is not doing enough to crack down. Not on doing enough to TTP crack down or not willing to. Bases. Um, not willing to. I, I think, yeah, they, they have not shown a willingness. I think they um, are not interested in cracking down on the TTP. They, you know, have certain connections and relationships, similar ideologies, and so they're just not willing uh, to uh, take down their bases or attack them um, or deal with them like they would uh, ISKP. So is it a source of concern for a U.S. national security? The TTP? The TTP and what's happening, you know, um, along uh, the Afghanistan-Pakistan border and so many terrorist groups, you know. Well, the U.S. has to monitor what's happening in Pakistan. We're talking about, you know, a, a very large population, you know, 230 million people. Uh, they have nuclear weapons. Um, you know, you have more uh, terrorist and militant groups in Pakistan than really any other country. Uh, so it's, it's a volatile mix in Pakistan, and the U.S. can't really afford to ignore what's happening there. So yes, it will remain a concern for the United States, um, and wow. the U.S. Will, will have to keep an eye on what is happening with these different groups. And of course, you have the tensions between Pakistan and India. And there are India-focused groups like Lashkari Taiba, Jeshi Muhammad, and others that, you know, they're, they're all linked with each other. They all have similar ideologies. Um, and they've all been able to operate inside Pakistani territory. So it's, it's a volatile mix, and it's something that the U.S., um, cannot ignore. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, there's a good argument to make that Pakistan has created a lot of these problems for itself. Yeah, um, you mentioned India. What do you think are Indian uh, national interests and security concerns addressed by the Taliban? Because Indians have been using a very mild tone uh, about the Taliban. So the, the Indian position toward the Taliban is very different from their policies in the 1990s. As you know, India, Iran, Russia all supported the former Northern Alliance and were very much opposed to the Taliban because they realized that the Taliban uh, could harbor groups that would target India. And they, they were friendly to other terrorist groups that were a threat to India. Um, but I think Post-August 2021, India has made the calculation that uh, it would rather try to uh, engage with the Taliban and try to get the Taliban to deal with the groups that threaten India 
in exchange for you know humanitarian assistance or uh, recognition, whatever um, the Taliban is is looking for. So India has a completely different policy toward the Taliban than it did you know 20, 25 years ago. And I think it's very interesting uh, to watch that evolve. And, and I don't know how it will work out for India, but I think India's calculations are, you know, get the Taliban to crack down on those groups that are a threat to India. Um, and is it a, I mean, wise calculation, you think? Because as you say, Taliban have been supported by, by, by Pakistani establishment for their entire uh, being and life. Uh, since they were born uh, in 1990s. Do you think this is a, a wise calculation by the Ian authorities to, you know, uh, to invest on the Taliban for cracking down against groups who are uh, terrorizing India? Well, I suppose from their perspective, uh, it's worth a try. Um, I don't think ultimately, you know, that the Taliban's never going to turn against Pakistan. They're always going to have close relations. Uh, so again, I'm, I, I don't know that ultimately this is going to uh, work out in a way that does assist India. But from India's perspective, you know, they, they want to try and see if they can get uh, the Taliban to at least be more agnostic toward them. Yeah, we, a few days ago, we just broke the news that the uh, Afghanistan embassy in New Delhi was closed down. And uh, a um, few months ago, there was another news that uh, India had accepted a diplomat from the Taliban administration. So um, do you think there is a kind of a new romantic relationship between India and the Taliban uh, appearing to, to, to surface? I don't think it's romantic. I think it's pragmatic um, on India's part. And again, I'm, I don't necessarily think it's, it's the right policy, but I think from India's perspective, they believe they're being pragmatic and they're dealing with the Taliban to try to protect their own interests. And they're not going to hassle them about human rights, women's rights. Um, and you know, clearly they're not supporting anti-Taliban groups. Uh, you know, as they did in the, the 1990s. late 1990s. Yes, and our another uh, neighbor, major neighbor, China, uh, they just sent a, an ambassador to Kabul. Uh, what do you think, what China is after in uh, Afghanistan? Well, I think that uh, China, you know, wants to compete with the United States. So I think they, they figure that you know, having a good relationship with the Taliban is going to somehow um, allow them to, you know, get the strategic upper hand um, in the region. Yeah, I think they have economic interest in Afghanistan, but I think what the Chinese will find is there are some of the same challenges that have always been there. You know, the, the Chinese made this major investment in Mace Anak, uh, copper mine many, many years ago. Never, you know, went anywhere. Nothing happened with it. Um, and, you know, a lot of those same challenges are still there with the infrastructure um, and, and the lack, you know, the lack of transportation options, infrastructure, power. Um, you know, the, you, you, you don't have any more technical capabilities with the Taliban than you would have with the previous government and things were difficult uh, when the previous government, the Ghani government was there. So I think there's a lot of talk about Chinese investment in Afghanistan, but where it really goes, what it results in, I think that's still a major question mark. Yeah, China and Russia, two both, uh, I mean, uh, largest US adversaries in the region and the world are involved in Afghanistan. Does it make uh, United States concern uh, about the future and its interest in the region? Or do you see any threats against U.S. interests by these two countries inside Afghanistan? Uh, well, I think that uh, there will be threats to the United States. Um, and I think it will come you know, from terrorists, um, particularly Al-Qaeda um, or affiliated groups. So, you know, to the extent that um, these 
terror, you know, Afghanistan reemerges as a terrorist base. Yes, it uh, could be a threat to the United States. And you think China and are you are you trying to say China and Russia are uh, kind of uh, facilitating that process of Afghanistan becoming a harbor for terrorism? Well, I think that in the long run, if they have the soft policies towards Taliban, that yes, they could feed that problem over time. Because I think the way that the Taliban are treating women um, and the kind of repression that they're uh, taking out on the women will, you know, that's a sign that they uh, still harbor extremists. They have still opened, um, my understanding, hundreds of madrasas that are inculcating young men in these extremist um, backward beliefs. Um, and that mindset will facilitate the development of terrorist movements. And so, yes, over the long run, if, if you're not trying to, um, you know, um, influence the Taliban to have policies that are more reflective of, uh, you know, a developing, you know, modernizing economy, uh, then eventually you're going to see an Afghanistan that goes back to being a terrorist safe haven, which will be a threat mm. to everyone, the Russians, the Chinese, the Pakistanis, the U.S., everyone. Um, so under this, uh, you know, regional uh, circumstances and the kind of policies the Taliban have, uh, you know, um, used since they're coming back to power, uh, do you see the Taliban can run for long and stay in power for, for long? Or what do you envision for the future of Afghanistan? Or do you see a kind of collapse or maybe a civil war upcoming in Afghanistan? Well, no economy can thrive when you keep 50% of your population out of that economy, right? They, they, you know, by not educating your women and girls, uh, not allowing them to be part of a productive workforce, you're basically driving your own economy into the ground. So I don't see how you know any regime can survive uh, over the long term when you're clearly taking steps that are, are going to disadvantage your economy. You know, this is the 21st century, and uh, the Afghanistan economy will not be prosperous if you're not educating your people and you're not um, uh, allowing the health facilities, the, the socioeconomic indicators to progress and move forward. Afghanistan will just continue to fall further and further behind yeah. and, and eventually become a failed state if it isn't already. Okay, and anything is possible uh, within failed states. And um, so what's the U.S. going to do about it? Do you see, uh, do you think any changes will come after U.S. elections uh, next year? Like, um, um, do you think President Biden will change his uh, positions on Afghanistan if he wins uh, the, the elections, or do you think that if Republicans win this election, there will be a change towards Afghanistan? I don't see President Biden changing his policies on Afghanistan. I think he would like to turn away from the situation in Afghanistan and, uh, you know, just not pay attention to it um, and, you know, focus on other issues. That seems to be his policy. And unfortunately, I, I don't see that changing. Now, you raise an interesting point. If there's a different administration, you know, say a Republican uh, were to win the next election, um, that would at least open the option of having uh, a different policy toward Afghanistan. I think that you know, because the withdrawal went so badly for the Biden administration, it was so chaotic um, that that is one of the reasons. And, and you know, we saw the, the Biden's polling dropped, mm -hmm. dropped, you know, a few percentage points. And, and he never regained those points after the fall of Afghanistan. 
So it, it was a huge watershed in terms of reflecting his competence on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Some people even say that it um, inspired the Russians to mm -hmm. invade Ukraine when they saw the disaster that happened in August 2021 in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. So, you know, it's just not an issue that President Biden wants to revisit. Um, and you think if a uh, Republican administration comes, they will revisit? Well, there's the possibility for uh, what, what a kind of changes policy. you you anticipate uh, in such a you know there could be more support for um, expatriate Afghans, you know, anti-Taliban um, Afghans. There could be uh, more support for women's and girls' rights. Um, you 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 at least have the possibility you could see certain changes um, in. The, um, but not sending the back troops to Afghanistan. Not sending back troops. That's not that. On that's the table. not an option for the United States for the foreseeable future, no matter if you have a Republican or a Democrat in office. So, what what are the major security concerns for um, the U.S. from Afghanistan under the Taliban? Well, again, I think the the. Biggest concern is the rebuilding or reconstitution of Al Qaeda. Um, that would be a major concern. Um, ISIS uh, K or ISKP is also a major concern. I think um, right now the assessment is uh, that you know they are limited in the external operations that they would be able to carry out mm. but that that could change that uh, yeah they could become capable of carrying out external attacks yeah. so i think you know it's the same things we were concerned about 2 years ago is um, iskp al qaeda um, and you know and then i think the the general concern about a humanitarian disaster. Um, you know, some of that has passed since the U.S. You know, the U.S. is the biggest humanitarian assistance provider to Afghanistan, but there are other countries as well. The U.N. is there, you know, staving off um, a, a, you know, a serious um, food crisis hmm. uh, for the time being. But that that's another major concern. And you know, the idea of, you know, refugees flooding out of the country um, if things get really bad. This is another concern, uh, security concern. And the Europeans are even more concerned about this because they're closer to to the issue. You know, one of the consequences of the Doha deal and in, uh, um, the withdrawal, US, uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan was, I think, uh, the, uh, you know, breaking this... Uh, sense of trust after 20 years of partnership between the United States and, and, and uh, um, people in Afghanistan. Why do you think people in Afghanistan should trust the U.S. policymakers and governments again? Well, I don't necessarily think that the Afghan people should trust uh, the United States. I think what they can do is continue to work with um, people in the United States, uh, the U.S. Congress, um, there there should continue to be a partnership uh, because there are you know so many Afghans that have fought side by side with U.S. soldiers that you know were trained by U.S. troops um, that have the same values uh, that the Afghan civil society has. I mean, look, the U.S. poured hundreds of millions of dollars into NGOs that were there to empower women, to help educate women. Uh, the U.S. built this whole uh, civil society infrastructure, partnered with the Afghan people to do that. And those Afghans are still around. Um, and many of them are, have been um, persecuted by the Taliban, uh, put in prison, tortured. You know, we have reports of the UN and other uh, international organizations, and they were uh, partners of the United States. 
I, this is absolutely devastating. And it's, it's difficult to, to even talk about because I know that you are right. Uh, and that there have been so many Afghans who have been killed, so many that are still under threat that need to get out of Afghanistan. And the, unfortunately, the U.S. government has moved uh, too slowly in processing uh, visas, in um, you know, carrying through with uh, helping those Afghans that helped the United States government for all those years. Uh, to get out of the country. And, and my, my final question, what is the biggest lesson learned from Afghanistan for the United States? Well, I think that's, you know, that's something that the, the Afghanistan War Commission is, is looking at. I think there are so many lessons um, for both uh, the United States, but for Afghans as well. Um, and I think for the United States is that um, if, if you commit to making major change in a country, you better see through those changes. And you, you cannot uh, commit halfway uh, to uh, you know, making such big changes in a country. You can't abandon the project halfway through and not expect there to be serious consequences for the American people, for the U.S. policy, for, you know, U.S. foreign policy in other parts of the world. Uh, there, there are huge reverberations. So I think that's the biggest lesson, that you, the U.S., you're going to pay a price if you, you know, abandon a commitment before you've seen it through, there will be foreign policy repercussions for the United States. Mr. Curtis, thank you so much for coming to our studio and, and your time. Well, thank you for having me.